Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Jones Seminar Series. Um, and as I was just joking with, with our speaker, this is the first seminar series in a long time for somebody who's not looking for a job, because we, we've been doing a faculty searches continuously for the last uh, month and a half and had many, many faculty searches. So this is, uh, apparently he's not looking for a job. I don't know, although we, we, we could probably make one if he was looking, but... Uh, this is, it's an honor to have uh, Robert Wood come from the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, he's the Charles River Professor of Engineering and Applied Science there. He received his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer science at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's founder of Microbiotics Lab, which leverages expertise in microfabrication for the development of biologically inspired robots and features sizes on the micro with feature size on the micrometer to centimeter scale which I'm sure we're going to hear about today uh, he's winner of multiple awards I won't list them all but DARPA young investigator award NSF career award ONR young investigator award Air Force young investigator award technology reviews TR 35 uh, multiple best paper awards in 2010 he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers from President Obama for his work. In 2012, he was selected for the Alan T. Waterman Award, the National Science Foundation's most prestigious early career award. He's been PI or co-PI on over 20 sponsored research projects in the past four years. NSF uh, sponsored expeditions in computing RoboBees project that he'll be talking about today, I believe, is, uh, is one of those, um, and is, his work is also dedicated to STEM education, using novel robots to motivate young students to pursue careers in science and engineering. So please uh, welcome him. Thank you for coming. So thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you today about some of our work, uh, in particular on things like this, the RoboBees uh, project. Um, and to start, to the, though, well, the, I guess here's, here's a more, more general overview of some of the things that we do. Um, if we have time, I'll touch on a few of these, uh, but I'm going to be mostly talking about, about some of the, uh, the flying robots that, that, uh, that make up the RoboBees project. Um, so let's start with that. But to start this sort of discussion on the RoboBee project, uh, it's a very bio-inspired project, and we take inspiration from things like this. This is a carpenter bee. And, and uh, as engineers, we can look at this and, and ask sort of really pointed questions, like uh, how are the wings moving, and generating and manipulating vortex structures in the air? How are, you know, how are the thoracic mechanics moving the wings that are, that are generating these vortex structures in the air? What is the, the musculature that's driving the thoracic mechanics that are moving the wings? What are the metabolic processes? that are powering flight, you know, what are the sensor modalities that are used for different types of flight, uh, different types of maneuvers, uh, what are the sort of control architecture, et cetera. So I can, you know, you can go on and on with these really interesting, well-posed questions that then we have to answer if we want to do things like this, which is create these small flying robots. Um, and so these are the types of questions which uh, form the foundation for all the basic research topics uh, in the RoboBees project. And I'm going to touch on uh, a bunch of those today uh, as I go through uh, uh, the overview of this. I won't say too much about uh, um, applications throughout this work, but you can kind of things we might be interested in, uh, you know, search and rescue, these things, hazardous environment exploration, assisted agriculture, uh, you know, things you know, which would be having uh, highly agile, very cheap, maybe cheap to the point of disposable uh, systems operating to get holes greater than the sum of the parts, sort of analogy to social insects. Um, but, but really nice, but that's really several decades away. Uh, what really motivates us is, is the answers is to uh, to these basic questions. Um, 
Since all of the, the, the sort of subsystems that I'll talk about for this device, the, with, with very few exceptions, they must be created from scratch. There's really nothing off the shelf that we can take and use for these. There's a tremendous amount of technology fallout uh, along the way, and these are the, the real things that motivate us. So throughout the talk, uh, the, at least the first part of the talk, I'm going to be telling you about these four four topics, which are basically uh, stuff that we have done and, are, and, and have sort of shown uh, successful results with. And then I'll, in the latter half of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about a work in progress. But we basically have something like this as an inspiration, which is a, this is actually a hoverfly. Um, two wings, which are flapping uh, with a sort of sinusoidal trajectory. And then there's a, a second degree of freedom, which is this sort of uh, uh, periodic motion about the uh, rotation about an axis roughly parallel to the spanwise direction. So I'll first talk about how do we build them, uh, then, then how do we actuate them. I'll talk about some bio-inspired designs, and I'll talk about some control. So let's first take a little, little bit of a divergence over to, to thinking about manufacturing. And if I think about the sort of scale of, of devices, of robots, let's say, that I might want to make, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm characterizing these by, let's say, something, something like a characteristic dimension. Maybe that's the, the length of the cord, wing cord, or maybe that's the pitch of a gear tooth or something like that. Um, then, you know, looking across the sort of spectrum of, of sizes that I might have, there's a, you know, a number of techniques that might be appropriate to try to build these things. And so maybe on the lower end of the of the spectrum, uh, there might be some integrated circuit-derived uh, microelectromechanical systems processes, so MEMS, MEMS techniques. I'm showing, actually, I, I, I should update this. This is uh, now a, a very outdated device. This is a, a Texas Instruments DLP projection uh, a chip, which is, you know, whatever it is, four technologies out of date by now. But, um, but the idea is here, you have an array of roughly two million individually addressable mirrors, single axis of, of actuation uh, that creates these high resolution displays. It, it displays, it, it demonstrates a huge degree of parallelism, uh, huge, a huge complexity that you can get out of these types of systems. Uh, but it really, it, it doesn't quite fit what we want to do in the sense of, uh, you know, all of these techniques are using uh, either surface or bulk micro-machining techniques. So you're really getting these sort of two-and-a-half-dimensional devices, um, whereas we need something that's sort of more, more sort of three-dimensional topologies. Um, you're, you're somewhat limited in terms of the materials, but the most important thing uh, for us is uh, that we need a, a technique that we can do in-house, cheaply, uh, accessibly for, for our students, frankly, because we know very little about the types of devices we want to build, so we have to go through a very rapid build and test, build and test, build and test, often to failure uh, type of process. And, and of course, at the larger end of the spectrum, I probably don't need to motivate that, uh, you know, if I'm talking about something that is, you know, on the scale of an insect, I don't want to have, you know, assembling things under microscopes with thousands of parts of arbitrary sort of geometries and, you know, the, the sort of nuts and bolts. So what, is the, what, what do we do then? And I'm actually going to contradict myself. I don't know why this isn't playing. I'm actually going to contradict myself here. This is, this is the sort of nuts and bolts approach, otherwise known as graduate student with tweezers process, uh, <laughs> which is just what it looks like. So you have these individual components that the student is, is piecing together under a microscope. Um, I won't get into details of what these are, but the, needless to say, this, creates, this, this requires a tremendous amount of skill, learning, patience. It's tedious. Uh, it takes a long time, the yield is very low, uh, and, and all of these bad things. There's actually a more subtle aspect of this uh, as well, which is if it takes you, you know, several days or weeks or whatever to build these things, um, then they're precious, and, and you get, you know, you're very conservative with not only how you test them, but also how you design them, and so you don't really have the opportunity to explore this really rich design space uh, that, that otherwise you might be able to do. And so, <clears throat> if, if I may be so bold, we... Uh, um, took some inspiration from uh, Richard Feynman's famous talk, uh, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he described the, the sort of, he prophesized about these sort of, uh, you know, potential benefits of, of micro-scale manufacturing, parallelism. He described tiny hands, so small robots building other small robots. And, and, and we sort of took that to heart and developed a technique. This is sort of in conjunction with, with that sort of inspiration as well as inspiration from uh, my son's library at the time, which consisted of lots of pop-up books, when that will become obvious in a minute. Um, and, uh, and we came up with this process, and it has basically four fundamental steps. The first is uh, taking the constituent components, and these are typically thin layers of, of, of but it can be 
arbitrary material. Uh, composites, metals, ceramics, polymers, doesn't matter. And we machine these in, in two dimensions. In this case, using a UV laser micromachining system, but, but it doesn't really matter. You could use, you know, EDM if it's metals. You could use, you know, water jets. You could use uh, other types of lasers, whatever is appropriate for the materials. Um, and and the, so we, we machine these in two dimensions. And, the, and we also uh, machine uh, in this first step uh, alignment features for the second step, which is uh, uh, lamination using persistent pin alignment. Uh, and so this actually um, is an interesting um, interesting step for several reasons. One is that uh, it, it sort of bonds together all of these different materials in this quasi two-dimensional composite. The second is that if you're talking about typical sort of additive processes, uh, whether it's 3D printing or even things like, uh, you know, multi-layer MEM structures, um, then, then you're actually going to start to uh, get, the tolerance is going to get worse the more, the more layers you add. You're basically going to be integrating error as you sort of build up in height. In this case, that's not actually true because you get something called elastic averaging. Basically, errors are canceling out and you actually get better tolerances the more layers you add to the structure. So that's a little subtle aspect of this. But you're left in three with this, this sort of quasi two-dimensional composite that you, you then release out of, uh, you know, you release sort of the sort of desirable component out of, out, out of the scrap and you're left with this thing that you then fold into its final configuration. Um, and so what I'm showing here is, is just a very basic structure where you have some rigid components sandwiching some thin polymer flexible component such that you can create these, these rather distinct lines and use that folding, use that uh, as the basis for articulation as well as for our assembly. And, but okay, but we don't just do things where we sort of do things, you know, like a paper airplane where we fold one, you know, we don't do serial folds where we fold one fold and then another fold and another fold. Instead, what we do is we leverage the fact that uh, the, the first three process steps allow us to um, create not just sort of spatially arbitrary designs, but also connecting the various layers within the composite however, however we want through the thickness of the device. What this really means is that we can create spatial mechanisms through the thickness, so parallel mechanisms, four bars, five bars, six bars, whatever, through the, through the thickness of the mechanism, and then sort of pull these out, just like a pop-up book, where you have, in this case, uh, this is showing the, the, the assembly of uh, one of these robots, where maybe we want a wing over here, and we want an actuator over here, and, and we have to sort of figure out how to assemble these things together, where they're starting from this flat conformation. Well, in this case, uh, we can design all of the assembly trajectories for each of these components as parallel mechanisms built into the thickness of the device. And then if it's done properly, the whole device now only has one degree of freedom that you just sort of push on or pull on or open like a book, uh, which assembles these, these complex structures. Here's what it looks like more in, in, uh, in, in real time. So this is, uh, this is again, this, this sort of uh, took inspiration from, from children's pop-up books, where you think about a pop-up book is assembling these fantastically complicated structures by extremely uh, unskilled uh, users, and I mean the, the, the children, not the people that make the books, the, uh, the, where, where, you, where you have these, you know, this very simple actuation where, in this case, I'm just pushing on it, um, but you can imagine you know, unfolding like a book or, or basically coupling any simple uh, in, imprecise motion to all of the assembly trajectories that you want for your, your final device. And then once you're done with this, you can freeze this. Um, and there's several ways to do this I won't get into. Um, you, you pluck out the device you want, uh, and, and, th and then you're done. You plug it in, and you're done. One of the nice, uh, several, several interesting aspects about this, um, one is that you can create arbitrarily complex structures, and this is maybe one rather simple example. Um, another one is that uh, what we have is basically a multilayer printed circuit board process. And so what this means is that we can, um, it's, it trivializes the integration of electrical components, and, and it, a little bit is shown here because we integrate an, an actuator, which I'll tell you about a little later. Um, it trivializes the integration of electrical components just through standard PCB stuffing methods, pick and place methods, then, and then we can fold it into three dimensions after that is, after that is done. So we can create um, the, these sort of integrated structures. Uh, and there's other things too with, uh, you know, this, this sort of structural efficiency of using uh, folded beams as opposed to, uh, you know, more bulk materials. Okay, but there's a problem, uh, and the problem is illustrated here. So uh, we have um, the, this is, this is a composite of one of these, of the same device I just showed you, uh, and this is uh, something like 23 or something layers, uh, all, with, all with really important 
interdependencies that uh, define where the joints are, and all of the joints have to uh, be aligned appropriately such that there's only one degree of freedom without singularities, etc. And so this, this actually took the smartest person I've ever met about, about three months just clicking dots and solid works to actually draw this. So that's, that's, not, that's not effective. What we, really, what we did was we took the process, the graduate student with tweezers process, where the individual parts were trivial to design. They're just very simple structures. But the, with the manufacturing, the assembly was really difficult. Now we sort of flip that around. This, if, if you have a design and you have this drawn, you basically follow a set of, you know, a set of recipes and, and, you're, and you're done. You get your device that you want. But the design is terribly complicated. Uh, and so um, what we've done for that is I won't show snippets of this, but you can go and um, download the software. We actually, if you're, if you're interested in playing around with these techniques, and, and by the way, um, just through my walkthrough of some of the labs here, you have like three or everything you could possibly need to do this process. One of the, you know, and this is basically uh, assists with the design of these building, you know, scraps. It tells you, it turns out that it's, that, 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 it, that since you're working in, the, in, in sort of these quasi two dimensional composites, that uh, constructive solid geometry sort of processes that you would might want to do with three-dimensional objects uh, to talk about things like manufacturability or releaseability or whatever whatever sort of manufacturing specific things you might they actually become tractable to do that in a very simple way because you're in two dimensions. So anyways, this software sort of hides a lot of that and does a lot of that for you. So if you're interested, download that. Okay, so uh, I just want to show you a few things that we can make using this process. Um, and some of these maybe you've seen before. Um, anybody know what this is? This is going to unfold along sort of an axis that's uh, along this lower edge here. Anybody know what this is? No? Okay. A lot of these don't have a particular function. This is just to sort of show some of the, the, some of the devices we can make. Um, <coughs> this is another one without a particular function, but it illustrates, this is a, a carbon fiber connected chain. Th th this illustrates the ability to, that I was saying before, to pattern uh, the, the adhesives that bond the individual layers together such that I can bond any layer through, this, through the thickness of the device to any other layer in the thickness of the device. This allows us to create these interconnected chains uh, that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Uh, this is an example of showing parallelism. This is a, a set of spherical fibers bars, just like a, almost like a shoulder joint, two input, two output type of, uh, uh, of uh, flexure-based system. Uh, you can do this through the, just by arraying in the plane, or you can do this through the thickness if you'd like. Um, we also, um, oops, maybe I should go back. We also, uh, the next example that I'll show you is actually the answer to a question, um, can we make curved surfaces? And the answer is no, but we can make approximate surfaces. Um, in this case, this is a 20-sided regular poly, uh, polygon uh, and icosahedron. Uh, the, the, all of this sort of surrounding thing is the, is the assembly scaffold, which is controlling the assembly of this, uh, of this, uh, this, poly, this icosahedron in the center here. Um, we can make things that self-assemble. So this is a, a, another aspect of this. If you take this, these layered structures and you take one of the layers and put it in pre-stress before you align in this, uh, in this pin alignment during lamination, then you get this pre-stress that once you release the components that you want will be released and you pop into place. This is done, you can sort of tell here that there's this like serpentine spring in the middle of here which is causing this, uh, this is one millimeter on a side. Um, we, I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the other types of robots that we can make, these little, little crawling robots. Um, the, those, those sort of uh, motivate you know, the need, in particular, the last one I'll show you, maybe I'll show you a little bit later, um, you know, 20-legged, 40-actuator robots really sort of exacerbate the need to do things in parallel and to do things with, with good repeatability. This is uh, an example um, of a sensor that I'll come back to later that we use for flight stabilization of these devices, but it also illustrates the ability, like I was saying before, to pick and place electrical components on the surface of these things before folding up. In this case, it's a relatively simple pyramid structure, uh, but nonetheless, it allows us to make uh, some, some nice sensors. Uh, and again, I'll come back to that in a minute. 
we can make devices that are re that are really robust. So this is something that it's you know a couple of millimeters on a side, and uh, it's a little latch mechanism. So we have these little force sensors that we might want to plug a, a robot onto. We don't want to we don't want to glue it on, and so we make these little almost buckle like latch structures. You can just handle them by hand. They're they're extremely physically robust. Um, uh, we also so this is another example of a of a sensor that we can make. This is uh, if anybody has made an autonomous or used autonomous robots. Um, more than likely, they have you have a little lidar scan head, which is these sort of you know Coke can looking things that sit on the top, and they cost you know several thousand dollars, and they they work great. But uh, uh, what we wanted to do was was basically use this process to shrink this down. And so this is a, a voice coil actuated uh, a scan head for for this thing, which is now you know several orders of magnitude less massive. Uh, we have a new program that I won't have much time to get into. Um, but, but you know, throughout the talk, maybe you can get a sense that um, you know these techniques that I'm describing uh, are useful. They're, they're, they enable our research in these small-scale robots. Uh, but we're also starting to leverage these for other things. So one of the, one of the other uh, relatively new programs we have is the development of microsurgical tools uh, using these these uh, articulated, uh, actuated, you know, monolithic uh, devices that we can make. And this is a very simple example of a gripper. Um, there's actually newer and, and more exciting devices. Who here has ever played with a Hoberman sphere? You know what this is? This is a little ball that, that sort of grows and this is one degree of freedom linkage. So this is, this is we worked with Chuck to, um, to create a 2D approximation of this. This actually shows the ability to create in-plane uh, hinges. Okay, so, so that, all of that said, um, you know, the, the question I started with was, well, how do we make something like this? You know, with feature sizes, I guess I didn't de describe it, but feature sizes on the order of a micrometer up to, you know, several centimeters. And so now we can do that. We can make more or less arbitrarily complicated uh, uh, devices uh, with embedded actuation, you know, even embedded sensors um, and, and at the scales of interest, and we can do this relatively easily in-house, arbitrary materials, um, and, and uh, and, and, and that works great. So the next step then, okay, is actuation. So how do we, how do we think about actuation? So if we, um, I'll make this sort of general hand-wavy statement that if you are building a robot or other electromechanical device that requires actuation, and you can use an electromagnetic motor, you probably have no reason to not do that. But if you're operating uh, in, at, at, for whatever conditions, uh, maybe it's because of the, the scale, maybe it's too small. Uh, maybe for some of our other work in soft robotics, uh, maybe the material constraints, you know, if I, can't, if I, 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 you know, I want to make something as soft as my skin, for example, then I'm not going to use the electromagnetic motor. So if my hand wavy argument that is, if you can use a motor, you should. If you can't, then there's very little options that you have. And so one of the basic uh, 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 sort of initial um, uh, investigations that we had was, well, uh, since we can't use electromagnetic motors, uh, what are we going to use? And so we went through this uh, this exploration of what, what are called induced strain materials. So basically materials which change their shape in a very simple way upon the application of an external stimulus. And so this can, this can include things like at the top, like piezoelectric materials, uh, bulk or single crystal. It can include solid state phase transition materials. It can include electroactive polymers, be they dielectric or elastic or, uh, or ionic, and there's several other things you could consider. Um, and we can then start to compare these using more or less standard metrics, even if you were go going to use a motor. Um, you know, things like uh, stress and strain, the product being work, uh, normalized the density is energy density, uh, multiplied by bandwidth is power density, um, and we can also think about efficiency. We, we're, very importantly, though, we also think about practicality. How easy is it to make these, these actuators? Uh, do they have some horrible nonlinearity that we would have to deal with? Do they require 10,000 volts? These types of things. And so the solution that we came up with is quite simple. And I'm not going to claim that it's the, the sort of you know, grand solution to, uh, you know, to, to lots of different problems requiring actuation. It works just well enough for this type of this, this class of device. But it's basically a clamp-free bending uh, piezoelectric cantilever, which is two symmetric plates of piezoelectric materials uh, bonded together. Uh, I apply a field across one of them, and by the converse piezoelectric effect, it wants to contract. But because of its boundary conditions, it can't, so it bends. And then you do this. Uh, you oscillate charge from one plate to the other, 
and it bends in both directions. So they have a couple of, um, a couple of benefits. One is scalability. So I don't think I mentioned this, but the, the, um, we, when we flap the wings of our devices, this is at the, the, the coupled resonant frequency of where the, the, the uh, resonant frequency is determined by the inertia of the wings and the stiffness of the actuator. And so as, as I get smaller, um, my, my resonant frequency monotonically increases as a function of decreasing characteristic dimension. So therefore, these, the, the wings want to flap faster as they go smaller. That's a benefit for these because the bandwidth for these things is extremely high. Whereas you might have something, the, the energy density is relatively low, maybe a couple joules per kilogram. Whereas something like a shape memory alloy might be several kilojoules per kilogram. Uh, but then, you know, if I can, if I can only oscillate a, a uh, shape memory alloy, at, you know, on the order of one hertz, that's not going to be appropriate. Whereas that's no problem for these classes of actuators. Um, the, the, uh, some of the drawbacks are that they're relatively brittle materials. I'm not going to really talk about that, but we've put a lot of uh, care into how we process them. Uh, but one thing I will come back to later on is they're, they're relatively high voltage, so several hundred volts. Low currents, but relatively high voltage. Uh, and so we have to deal with that. And we, we tend to use these things all over, and we can make these things in, in bulk. Uh, we, have other, we have other types of actuators that, we, that you can consider, too. I'm just throwing this in here because this is a, this is a small voice coil actuator um, using the same sort of manufacturing techniques. I'm just throwing this in here because for us, we're thinking about power delivery. So creating actuators for power delivery purposes, meaning I just want to flap the wings as, as best I can and to, to generate thrusts which overcome mg. I'll think about control on top of that in a minute. I'll describe that. But, but you might think about applications where um, you have sort of a separation of power and control, where I might have one set of actuators that's performing power, uh, that, that's delivering power to the load, and another set of uh, actuators which is um, somehow controlling, for example, control surfaces. Uh, but anyways, that's just another, that's just an aside. Okay, so now we can build things. We can actuate them. Um, and now the question is, well, what are the designs that we're going to think about? And so we have, I'll show you a couple of, uh, a couple of examples. Are basically the copter. Thrust overcoming MG. If I want to, let's say, maneuver, then I create a body torque such that I tip. I twist my, um, my thrust vector such that it takes on a lateral component and I move forward, okay? And so what that means is that we need to create roll pitch and yaw torques in addition to uh, modulating the thrust that the wings are generating. And so the way that we do this in this design is by basically splitting the device down the middle and having each wing uh, actuated independently. Um, here's something that we can, we can make these things in bulk. Here, here's what this might look like. If I um, flap them symmetrically, it looks like this, but I can do, since, since I'm basically cut down the middle, I can do uh, any sort of combination of different trajectories for both of the wings. And what happens is, is the way that this works is um, fixed frequency. So if I want to do, if I do uh, modulate my thrust, I basically just do amplitude modulation. If I do asymmetric amplitude modulation, then the, the side with a larger amplitude is going to have a greater wing velocity. The thrust generation goes as roughly as the wing velocity squared. So I get a greater thrust on that side, and I create a roll to torque. If I want to create a what we're calling a pitch according to this convention, then I can sort of bias my mid-plane stroke uh, for or after with respect to the center of gravity and create, create a torque. Uh, yaw is a little bit different in this case, um, where I, I keep again I keep the, freq the frequency the same, I keep the period the same, but I flap faster on the, let's say the downstroke than on the upstroke. So I create an asymmetric drag profile, and I kind of do this paddling motion to create yaw. Uh, torques. And okay, so that, that's one device, and I'll show you uh, much, much of the videos that I'll show you will be based upon that device. That's been the most successful device that we've demonstrated thus far. Uh, I want to show you one other, um, which is basically uh, the reason I'm showing you this is simply because of the complexity of this device. Um, this is an example of one of the more we've made, um, and, uh, and the, unfortunately, the latest generation is not quite ready, but is basically is now flight worthy. But the idea here is, uh, is a, it's a different method to create roll pitch and yaw torques, but it requires uh, quite a substantial transmission mechanism, which consists of, uh, I think, two planar four bars, two, two spherical five 
bars and four planar and four spherical four bars or something like that. Um, you know, several dozen joints, uh, all within you know a couple cubic millimeters, uh, and, it, and, it, and it operates. I won't, I, maybe I'll skip the operating principles for this, but it operates in a similar way, similar flight modes to a helicopter, and uh, and you can start to bias the different control inputs here. Um, to create these sort of offsets in your angle of attack, for example, to generate, uh, to generate yaw statically or to generate uh, roll more dynamically. Um, I won't, I'll, maybe I'll skip the details here, but nonetheless, this works. Okay, so, um, so we have the, okay, so now we know how to build things, we know how to actuate things. We have several classes of designs. The criteria by which I, I should have mentioned uh, is a, a design is a successful design. It, it, is that can it generate thrust greater than lift, at least within some factor of safety? And can it create uh, roll pitch and yaw torques in a, in a reasonably controllable and a reasonably uncoupled way? Um, and so you kind of saw this experiment uh, where, we were, where we had the flapping wing device sort of plugged into a force torque sensor, um, and, and so we can characterize all of these things uh, and, and sort of make sure that uh, we have devices that are ready for flight before we run through our control experiments. So here's, okay, so the next question is control. So um, here's what our, our control environment looks like. These things are, are tethered. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and they're in this environment, which is, consists of these motion capture cameras, which is a typical, you know, Vicon motion capture system, but not in a room like this. It's, it's, it's like this. It's like a, you know, a cubic foot in terms of working volume. And we've had to, you know, uh, I'm not going to get into the tricks, but we've had, we've had to sort of, you know, supercharge this system in order to get the latencies low enough and the bandwidth of this thing high enough. But nonetheless, this, is, uh, this works great for, for, for prototyping uh, various control architectures. So once we have the device, we can basically just plug it in, and, and here's, here's what it looks like. And, uh, and we have this sort of framework where we can do real-time control um, using this. You know, we don't have to worry about sensors. Uh, you know, this gives us more or less perfect state information. Uh, we can use this to simulate sensors if we like by sort of degrading that, that state information or leaving out key aspects of it. But nonetheless, this is basically a, a rapid prototyping architecture for uh, controllers we might want to use for these systems. And the control architecture is not particularly important, uh, although it does have a couple of distinct elements, a, a, uh, an, an, alt an attitude controller, which turns out to be the most important since the attitude two dynamics are fastest among, amongst the various modes of this system. Um, but you can imagine, uh, but, so the attitude controller basically just maintains whatever orientation is given to it by a lateral controller, which just basically says, as I said before, if I want to take on a, a lateral component to my thrust vector, then I need to sort of tilt my body. And then uh, the, al the altitude controller is actually given lowest priority because that's the easiest. But regardless of what is actually in these blocks, um, it turns out that this is a very, very useful way to think about this. We can plug in any controllers we want into these different blocks. We can do things like uh, adaptive controllers that are, would be good at, um, you know, learning sort of unknown aspects of some of the models, which there are, which there are plenty. Um, we can plug in, um, you know, things like repetitive controllers, which would be good for rejecting periodic disturbances that arise from these sort of oscillatory systems. Uh, we could plug in MPI. It, does, it doesn't matter. What, whatever it is, um, uh, whatever we want to do, we can do with this, this sort of system. And that's enabled in part by the following. This is what happens when you turn this on. Okay, it just, it just crashes, right? So uh, a couple things, a couple takeaways here. One is that they crash all the time and they survive. So uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is important, though, because if I was doing this with quad rotors, for example, I'm sure that I'm sure you've seen videos of, I would take great care not to crash things, right? Because they're either going to hurt me or equipment or themselves. Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter. You, you know, flies fly into walls all the time. They just bounce off. And that's, that's due to some physics of scaling uh, uh, arguments that says that things should be more robust uh, as, as you get smaller. Now, um, the other thing which, is, which this is showing is that these things are extremely open loop unstable. Uh, and which is good. So, um, you know, if we can stabilize these things, then that means that we can take advantage of this open loop instability to actually create rapid, uh, aggressive maneuvers. This is how insects, flies in particular, um, uh, avoid obstacles, avoid swatting, etc., um, by having, you know, local control loops stabilizing these unstable modes uh, using these gyroscopic organs called halteres. Um, and, and those sort of inject directly upon the flight muscles which are controlling flight and, and, and stabilizing flight, uh, and then descending visual information from, you know, 
detecting an obstacle approaching or, or, or whatever, um, would then interrupt that, destabilize the system, create a rapid divergence, which is, which is in the form of this rapid turn called a saccade, uh, and then, then restabilize the system. So we can do some, some similar things given this unstable nature. Notice that this would slow down by a factor of eight. This is what it looks like in real time. The things that we're trying to do here are basically taking this system sort of fresh from the box, if you will, and, and, and trying to understand its dynamics a little bit, you know, trying to do trimming flights. So we basically look at these things and say, okay, well, th th this has evolved for, since then. We have more automated ways to do this, but I don't have videos of it. Um, but in, in this sort of uh, primitive sense, we basically turn it on, see which way it sort of turns and sort of tweak knobs. Once we have a good operating point, then we turn our controllers on and, and you can get, you can get uh, stabilized flights um, and, and control these systems quite well. So this was this is a couple of years old now, but this was the first uh, uh, controlled flight that we had, um, uh, and we were, this is something that we were, you know, it seems simple enough, but uh, this is uh, something we were working on for, you know, 12 years or so uh, uh, to try to get this to work. So um, there's w one other thing to note about this is that we, this is specific to hover. Uh, we chose hover um, actually because we thought it's one of the harder things to do because if you, in the absence of things like forward flight, there's very little chance of having any sort of passive stability mechanism unlike sort of, you know, unlike uh, like a positive dihedral on, a, on, a, on, a, on wings of a fixed wing aircraft. Um, we can do lateral maneuvers. It's more interesting to see them in real time. Um, this, is, this is actually very simple. This is just doing fixed sort of changing the set points. Um, takeoff and landing is not, is, this is interesting. One thing that is interesting is we can start to use uh, the fact, again, that these things are physically robust to do um, things like iterative learning control. So if the dynamics don't change dramatically from one trial to the next, we can try to do very aggressive things like this, um, where we, this is actually trial eight, where the first seven failed miserably, but you can learn about the dynamics in a, in a sort of offline way. Way, using using these failed trajectories, uh, this is a, a process that's often used in you know in things like uh, robot manipulation. But we can start to do this now using using these types of systems as well. Okay, so okay, so so w what did I just tell you? So I basically just said okay, we can you know we we have all these really we think are really interesting open questions for what we would want to to do to design these flying these small flying robots, and we worked through several uh, several you know, sort of initial key challenges, you know, in terms of manufacturing, actuation, design, and control. Uh, there's a whole mess of things um, which this doesn't say anything about, which I'll tell you a little bit about the state of the art right now. Uh, so basically, these things are currently tethered, and so we are working our way through the rest of these topics to try to remove that tether. So that's maybe, maybe a little bit more simply stated. Uh, we need to have onboard sensing. We need to have onboard uh, computation, and we need to have onboard power. And so um, I'll tell you the state of the art in looking at that. One of the other things, though, that um, one of the other things that we didn't, uh, that I didn't really mention much, and, uh, and in fact, um, when we started the project, um, I drew up the wing shape uh, as I was making some of the initial prototypes several generations before what I showed you. And I said, you know, naively, I just looked at, okay, we're, we're sort of thinking about this like a hoverfly. And so let's find a similar, you know, let's find the appropriately sized species of hoverfly and sort of just copy its sort of gross morphological features in its wings, like second moment of area and aspect ratio and, you know, whatever. Assume that they're rigid flat plates and then, you know, flap them like a hoverfly flaps them and we should be good. And, and it worked. But that's, but that's actually bad. It's actually, we, it turns out that that was sort of, uh, you know, we were sort of victims to our own success in that regard in, in, in the sense that um, they worked well enough to, to, to get all these results. Um, but we have reason to believe that they're back basically a factor of three underperforming in terms of sort of the, the propulsive efficiency that they could get. Uh, and so the, that's sort of motivation for this body of work, which is, uh, which is on one of the ongoing hot topics in the lab, which is the following. If I want to understand something like the, the, the structure function relationships of these flapping wings, either to say something about maybe natural insects or to design better wings for these, these types of devices, then uh, there's several ways I could go about doing this. On the right is, uh, well, here, let's start with the left. So on the left is there's the constitutive laws for these fluid mechanics are the, the incompressible Navier-Stokes, which is, um, which is nice. You know, we 
can understand this, but it's a set of, you know, second order uh, coupled nonlinear partial differential equations, which are horribly complicated to solve. Um, and so, you know, the, at, least, at least when we started this a few years ago, um, computational fluid dynamics solvers, which could, which could handle this, and in particular, we could handle this at the types of Reynolds numbers that we're interested in, which is around 1,000, um, were extremely slow, where they're, they're sparse, but they're extremely slow. You know, it would basically, we could build the device and test it faster than we could actually, you know, press go and wait for the result. So, uh, and that actually, and I'm saying this in, in terms of uh, historical context because that's slowly changing, uh, but I'll come back to that. The other, the, the thing that's common in biology is to actually take, um, to take these, these, uh, the, what, you know, look at insect wing motions. This was done by my colleague uh, back in the late 90s, Michael Dickinson, who did the first sort of studies on how insects are actually flying, how they're generating sufficient thrust to stay aloft. Um, and, and what they did was they, they observed insect, uh, in this case Drosophila, uh, wing motions, and built a scaled up model of these things, uh, replayed these motions, did it in a dynamically scaled way, meaning immersed it in a tank of mineral oil such that the, the, the Reynolds number was the same as the actual insect. And then they were able to replay back these motions and, and measure forces. And so what they could do then is come up with time averaged uh, models, which are these quasi steady models, which basically hide all, all of these unsteady terms behind force, time, time averaged correct force coefficients. I mean, time averaged correct means that over one period it matches perfectly. But uh, it only does so for that one particular species at that one operating point, and it doesn't tell you anything about this sort of sub-period temporal dynamics of this. And so, um, so we are doing several things. Um, the, the first is actually we're writing our own CFD solvers, but uh, uh, they're not quite ready yet for me to show you anything on that. But we have uh, in, in the, the other side of this, this is sort of the brute force approach, where I've already showed you that we can build these wings and we can flap them around. Uh, we can also do things like make custom, uh, you know, lift and drag, uh, custom force sensors, multi-axis force sensors to measure things like lift and drag. We can do um, uh, flow visualization using particle image velocimetry, multiple high-speed cameras to look at motions and deformation. So basically we can prototype a whole bunch of wings, test them out, and see which one's better. So it's a really sort of dumb approach, um, but it leverages a lot of our strengths in being able to build these these types of things. This is sort of what it looks like from the outside. Here's the sort of typical motions that you might see. This is, you know, a factor of 100 or so slowed down. You know, we're talking about flapping frequencies between 1 and 200 hertz, um, which is, again, typical of, of the sort of scales of insects that we're interested in. And then we can start to do studies, and this is just, this is just some very preliminary stuff. But um, uh, the, uh, the idea here is, you know, for example, in the the upper left, we can look at either wing morphologies, or up in the upper right, we can look at actually some material properties. So, so thinking about changing the stiffness of some of the some of the passive components in the in the wing, for example, the wing hinge. Uh, and it turns out that both the aspect ratio and these and these uh, these sort of aero, aeroelastic components, if you will, are critical to the function of the wing. And that's probably an, a super obvious statement in hindsight, um, but something that we're sort of learning how to understand now and learning how to design better wings. And it's through this sort of, again, everything, more or less, one of the, one of the take home themes of this talk is everything that I'm saying is all enabled by the ability to do things like this. You know, we can spit out wings using these sort of mesoscale manufacturing techniques by the hundreds in, you know, all different shapes. And it takes about, you know, you know 10 minutes worth of manual labor to do that. Okay, so the, the next topic I'll tell you about is the is the power and control uh, systems for these for these robots. So we've we've done um, we've done a lot of sort of analysis on the, on the whole you know, holistic analysis of the entire thing. So the what's what's the eventual final uh, fully going to look like and in terms of specifically the uh, power and mass budgets, meaning how much power is dedicated to flight versus all the other functions, it turns out it's all, it's all the powering flight. Everything else, every other function that we have for this is, is only a few percent of what's pow of the power for flight. So this, is, this really illustrates, and the same thing can be said for, act, for, for um, the mass budget. Where is the mass of this device? Well, it's all in the, in the battery or the power source and the actuators. And this just is indicative, this is not so particularly surprising to us, it's indicative of the energetic expense of flight at small scales. So you're talking, you know, lift the drag coefficients on the order of, 
you know, one or less than one. Whereas, you know, a 747 or a, or a good, you know, you know, large scale glider would be on the order of, you know, 100. So, so the, the, uh, it, it's, it's partially due to, you know, the increased, uh, you know, viscosity as you scale down with and, and decrease your Reynolds number. But the point is that, that these, the flight at these scales is extremely energetically expensive. So it really means that power uh, for these things is important. Okay, so the architecture is, is as follows. Um, and, and this is some ongoing work that I'll just give you a glimpse of. We have um, a, a, co a coordinating integrated circuit. I'll come back to that. We have a, a power circuit, which is basically taking whatever power source we have, boosting that by a factor of 100. So this is to get up to the voltages that we want for the actuators, a couple hundred volts. Now, mind you, this is at, uh, this is at you know, maybe, uh, you know, Tens of, million, uh, tens of milliwatts of, of power. So this is actually uh, relatively low power devices. Um, but nonetheless, to boost that up and, and also do some tricks about generating sinusoids to drive the actuators at relatively low frequencies and sloshing charge back and forth for charge recovery for efficiency purposes, et cetera. So there's, that, there's a high voltage IC that does that. There's this, it also has some custom, that's what this is. It has some custom magnetic components that we've created in house. This overall topology, if you're interested, is a tap Conductor auto transformer topology, which does the boost and this sort of sloshing charge back and forth to the plates of the piezoelectric. The, maybe the more interesting topic, though, is um, uh, is well, what are we doing for a power source? And so we're doing uh, several things. So first is we're working with a group uh, at Harvard, the, the Jennifer Lewis's group, um, to create custom micro batteries. So she's she has some recent papers. She's an expert in additive manufacturing, and she has some recent excellent results in the ability to actually print uh, batteries at, at sort of, you know, millimeter scales. We're also working with, we were working with a group to do uh, solid oxide microfuel cells. I'll show you some results in a little bit on, on wireless power transfer for other classes of robots. And we, uh, we're also working with a group now that does uh, thin, um, uh, high-efficiency solar cells. Uh, this is a, an example of sort of these these sort of printed micro batteries that we're, that we're making. Um, and then the last, or the penultimate topic that I'll mention is, uh, is the, the, the computation architecture. And so this is something which is um, uh, developed by some of our collaborators who are VLSI experts, and they, they develop uh, unique computation architectures to do um, extremely high performance, low power computing based upon what are called hardware accelerators. And what that means is it's sort of the antithesis of a, uh, of a general purpose computer, whereas a general purpose computer can do lots of things but know one thing particularly well. Uh, these accelerators you can think about as, as extremely focused uh, computational units that do one thing and do one thing extremely well. And so if you do something like, you know, take the singular value decomposition of everything that the, the, that's going on within the sort of brain of the bee, maybe it's, you know, controlling an actuator, running a control loop, processing sensor information, coordinating communication, whatever it might be, um, then they have a method by which you can take C code descriptions of these functions and then translate them directly into Verilog and spit out integrated circuits to do these, uh, to do these things. So we're on the second generation of this, um, and as we speak, my students are integrating these um, on board to do the control functions that you saw that were happening. I didn't point this out, but there's the Vicon system, and then there's a bank of computers which are doing sort of all the sensor processing and then generating the control signals. So that's now being integrated into these uh, accelerators. Uh, and, and for that, we've actually developed, um, I, didn't, I, don't have a, I, I couldn't find a video of a closed loop version for this, but this is a slightly larger version of the device that I showed you uh, earlier, uh, which was designed using everything we've learned thus far in terms of the fluid mechanics, everything we've learned thus far in terms of actuation, using the latest and greatest manufacturing techniques with the goal of getting something that could have sufficient payload to carry everything on board uh, in terms of all the sensors, all the computation, and the power. And this is, it's, it's subtle here, but it's actually carrying, you know, dummy weights which represent all of that. So that's a success. So we're, so we're basically integrating all of that currently on board. And the last thing I'll tell you about with this is, is, is sensing. I'm just going to show a couple of videos. This is, uh, and maybe I'll have to show this again. Um, We've looked at a bunch of different sensor types. I'm not going to have time to get into each of the sensors that we, that we have looked at, looked at but they, they, follow, they fall into several criteria. They have to fit in within the, the mass and power budgets allotted for the whole vehicle, of course, but they, and they have to give us useful, useful uh, state information. And so uh, we've tried a whole 
a bunch of things. This is an example of a bio-inspired sensor sitting on top. Oh, it's very hard to see. I apologize. There's basically these bio-inspired sensors, which are, which are thought to be horizon detection sensors in insects. So in insects, there's these things, which, are, which is what's circled at the top here, called ocelli, which are these defocused photoreceptors looking at different areas of the sky sphere. And if you assume that the light intensity is a monotonically decreasing function of latitude, then by just looking at different areas of the sky, sphere you can tell, and looking at the light intensity, you can tell where you are in terms of your absolute orientation relative to the sun or the horizon. And so uh, um, I believe all insects have these, and so it's been questioned what is the role for these things in, uh, in, in, in flying insects. And so we can make these things, they're trivial to make, they're photovoltaic, they're very low power, lightweight. We can plug them in, and, and this, is what, this is what happens when we use them not for absolute orientation, but actually rate information. And so this is actually is a little bit long-winded, but this is one example where we can start to take you know, bio-inspired devices and sort of turn it around, actually use these things to test hypotheses uh, that would be difficult to, to, to test with the animals themselves. And so this is, what this is actually doing is not using absolute angle information from the sensor as was sort of hypothesized in insects, but actually using angular rate information derived from these sensors and using a, a trivial control law that basically applies a torque in the opposite, you know, proportional uh, to the magnitude of the sensed angular velocity in the opposite direction, and, 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 it, and it works to, to stabilize attitude. And there's nothing else going on here. It's just stabilizing attitude. And so we wrote a paper about this just, that's sort of hypothesizing maybe this is what's happening um, in, in terms of a, an extremely simple, almost trivial control law that insects would be, would be able to implement. But we've also done things with more typical... This is actually the only example where we can use anything remotely off the shelf. And, it's, and it looks ridiculous, right? Because this is basically dominating the mass of this device, uh, which is, this is a, a six-axis IMU, uh, nine-axis IMU, uh, which is given, you know, uh, gyroscopic information and, uh, and also an accelerometer. But we can start to, you know, plug in sensors like this. This is a prototypical example. We can start to plug in sensors like this and have them in the motion capture arena, but then sort of use the motion capture arena as, as uh, training wheels, where we start to sort of slowly remove this information and see if we can still stabilize flight. Now, this is just using the, the motion capture system for position and all of the uh, uh, angles and angular, angular velocities are being sensed uh, using the sensor. It actually turns out that the flight is arguably more stable for this because uh, even despite our best efforts, there's still some latency in the system, uh, in the motion capture system, which affects the controller, of course, whereas in this case, there's almost no latency, and so you can actually close the loop much faster. Um, okay, so that, that's our work in, uh, in, in these small-scale robots with the goal of, um, of, of bringing things, these to, to greater autonomy. Uh, if you ask me how confident I am in this and when will it happen, uh, the next step, we, we've been integrating sensors for a while, the next step is integrating computation, and that has to happen um, over the next few months. Otherwise, several students don't graduate, so that, that must happen. Um, and then power is probably going to be the biggest challenge that, that uh, we're going to be working on likely for several years. Okay, so, um, and then, so since I'm basically out of time, I'll just show you um, some related work in small-scale uh, terrestrial robots, and I'll leave uh, uh, some work. Some some of our work in printable robots and soft robots for my next visit. Um, uh, so, so we use the same techniques, the same manufacturing techniques, to make, make uh, small legged robots as well. So, so this is this is again this is an example I'm sh showing you um, f because of it sort of motivates the need to have these high repeatability, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of mass produced sort of structures. This is a 20 legged, 40 actuator robot. The the idea here, uh, I'm also showing you this because of, of the following, again, sort of hand-wavy statement. If I think about the complexity of a robot um, or any system, maybe that, that's defined by the number of actuated degrees of freedom, and I think about how that scales, I would argue that as I get smaller, the complexity decreases just, for, just because it's so difficult to make these, these types of devices. But with our process, that's not true. So we, can, we don't sacrifice complexity and the types of things that we can make as a function of uh, But we use this, um, this robot to study um, how passive undulation modes arise due to intersegmental compliance, and, and, and it actually compares nicely to some literature on, uh, on myriapod locomotion. And, and it looks really creepy. Um, so the, the, and then uh, related work, we can also, we're also making 
using uh, uh, these sort of more insect-inspired uh, robots, and um, you can kind of seeing different gates here up in the upper right. Um, and, and we can, again, use these, these types of robots for exploring terror mechanics. One of the most important things that these robots are good for, actually, is, uh, as you can kind of tell in the middle, we use these things as proxies for, um, before we put things on RoboBees, we, we test everything out on these small crawling robots for very simple reasons. The payload capacity is higher. And, you know, we, we don't have to worry about, you know, if we shut the thing off, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't crash or whatever. So, uh, and so we've tested, we've used these to test out a whole suite of sensors. We've tested, this one is also testing uh, onboard power using solar cells. And we've also, a couple slides, I'll show you um, some tests that we've done using this device for uh, wireless power transmission. Um, it turns out that these are some of the fastest robots on Earth, um, if, if you normalize to body length, of course. So, you know, 12, length, 12 body lengths per second is actually twice as fast as Usain Bolt. Um, and, and we also do things like, you know, like I said, so, some terra mechanics studies, some, some energetic studies, and it turns out that um, the cost of transport, which is the standard <coughs> unit of measure of how, how efficient locomotion is, these things line up very well with other high-performance high robots and um, similarly sized insects. And as I mentioned uh, before, we use these as proxies to, uh, to test other things. This is one of the first experiments using wireless power transfer. This is with a group in the University of Washington that specializes in near field and far field. I'm only going to show you near field uh, RF power transmission, um, and in, in this case, extremely near field. It only works over a couple centimeters. But the idea is that we are, um, that we are able, we're, we're, we're sort of looking at all potential options for power, um, you know, including uh, you know, putting e e even if this is this is where we di if we differ from our colleagues, and they're not here, so I can so I can pick on them. But they really care about efficiency. I don't care at all about efficiency. I just want power transfer. So, but uh, but they care about efficiency, and so we have this sort of uh, this sort of trade-off. But anyway, so th we were able to do um, uh, we're able to do uh, a wireless power transfer for these things as well. So I think I'll stop there because I'm basically out of time, and I don't want to continue to bore you on a Friday afternoon. Um, and I'll save some of these other topics for later on. Um, I will say, um, uh, maybe I'll give, give a, a plug for, uh, here, let me, let, me just, let me just skip ahead and give a plug to, uh, to my, my students um, who are the real, oh, these are the people that did the real work. Um, come down and see us. We're also part of this thing called the Visa Institute biologically inspired engine. Uh, um, look, look that up if you're interested. It's uh, uh, it's this fantastic that in West, I guess Boston area um, uh, research institute and, and uh, is 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 a research institution, but it's really foundational research. So we're really pushing, you know, uh, company, you know, a lot of a lot of the technology. For example, the manufacturing method. Now there's a company that started. Uh, um, you know, a lot of a lot of clinical uh, collaborations that happens as well. So if you're interested in that, uh, that's W Y S. And uh, uh, with that, any questions you might have. Yeah, that's a great question, and, and, and the and the to be particularly satisfying is basically we're not sophisticated 
enough yet to but I can quote to, so so we basically um, because steady models and all of our current CFD models um, rigid flat and all, all the previous in, in analyzing biology to my knowledge assumes um, that that's what we strive for them as rigid and, and, and but the inertia to make them rigid and okay but um, there's been papers that I've read in biological literature which asks like when things corrugated and why why is there you know passive curvature that arises in, in, in most insect wings as a function of uh, and is the main structure then couple sort of passive you know there's a really be beautiful paper I read that looked at Insect wings sort of have these for neopter and insect wings have these really, really beautiful characteristic you know, curves in the veins. And the argument was well, rise to passive twisting, which couples into this sort of you know beneficial curvature on, on one stroke. So, all right, so no, and, and uh. We could do things uh, as, as as you have done, passively curving structures based upon. Just don't I don't know any better, and so that's a, that's a work in progress. Yeah. The quality factor is also going down. The quality going down. That's sort of yeah. When I first by bandwidth, so there's I could quote here. One is the actuator itself. Uh, add a load to the actuator, and then there's the loaded bandwidth. And but what I mean with that is. Um, with respect to the actuator itself, I naively perhaps want to basically limit to the quasi-static range of that actuator. So I basically want to be of that actuator. And the reason I do that is just because I have an actuator on my own as an instance for these types of often shatter. Because the Q is relatively high, you know, on, you know, on the order of 10-ish. Okay, but when I start to load it, then the, you know, the bandwidth decreases. I'm operating at resonance, and this the Q is actually relatively, you know, 1.2. But that's not a bad thing necessarily, because if you had a high Q, that means you're not, you don't have many losses. Which sounds it means you're not dissipating energy into the air, which you want to do. So, so in the Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this is a play, play. In fact, we've recently a, a fair bit of effort into understanding that and come up with tricks. 
metrics to uh, maximize the lifetime. So maybe a year or so ago, lifetimes were on the order of, of you know, uh, um, which at you know at, at 100 or so hertz means I don't know tens or hundreds of thousands of cycles. Good results because you know tens of minutes, 20 seconds at a time. Or okay, uh, it's never. Uh, 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 but you, sure, you can have applications that, that you might envision that that would be a problem. We we put in some effort and and uh, you know fixed a few things. Getting we got it up to plus maybe even up to ten uh, just by simple obvious and hindsight engineering. I see. Doing everything electrically is a way to go, but you could deliver the power to the heat to radio frequency. Lower. Yeah, or elastically, yeah. 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 No, that's a great idea, yeah. That's a, that's a great. We have that. So, um, you know, we've thought about you know wireless, uh, but in terms of other transduction, energy storage, mechanism. You can go one step, actually, a project, uh, I guess it's since ended, uh, where to and fly them around using using uh, their, their uh, neural architecture. Research that um, you're pursuing in collaboration with biologists? Yes, uh, we're very talented biologists. But what, what I found in that specific sort of flipping the, the bio inspired arrow is, is, uh, uh, is pretty ad hoc. It's not particularly structured because it's more of a, a ooh, what is this thing? Maybe example I can give to something which has some, some sort of structure to it is the wings. So we, the fact that we can mechanisms, we can flap things, and then we can do also we can you know, you know create also want. Um, I'm I'm very hopeful, but maybe not. something about the actual insects. 